Here we are, episode four. Uh, today's episode is, uh, is really a foundational episode uh, to help us make sure we're putting in place the building blocks for the podcast and uh, what we're trying to achieve. And today we get to talk about uh, drug pricing. The title of the episode is Understanding the Dynamics of Drug Pricing. And Scott, you want to tell us who our guest is today? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, nice to be with you. And uh, we're super excited today to have uh, Professor Jamie Robinson from uh, the University of California, Berkeley, uh, n- very noted health economist and a, and a really uh, deep national expert uh, in the, at the intersection of, uh, I'll say, medical technology generally uh, with pricing and affordability and, and sustainable innovation. So it should be a lot of fun to be able to talk with Jamie. Well, it is going to be fun, and I even read read his book uh, over the weekend. So, uh, and not the Cliff Notes version. The real, yeah, great. The, I read I read the book. So, uh, but I did think after reading the book that it'd be important to just align around the nomenclature. So, when people talk drug pricing, uh, if you're talking to a family member, they might think they're they're talking about the patient cost sharing. Uh, in our case, when we talk drug pricing, we're really talking about the wholesale acquisition cost. Uh, sometimes it's called the, the list price. Um, you'll hear different things. Uh, uh, I think it's also important to realize that there's a, that if it's physician administered or hospital administered, there could be a whole other price for a particular drug. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the, the, the patient and the cost sharing and what they pay out of pocket is, um, is not determined by the manufacturer at all, but it's really you know, based upon the, the benefit plan design. So. I know we have a lot of access nerds, and they probably didn't need uh, 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 have that introduction. But for those uh, who are uh, new to new to the access uh, market, access and and uh, affordability space, I just wanted to make sure that we aligned on all of that. Yeah, great. So, uh, Jamie, uh, I've had the good fortune of being able to collaborate with you for a number of years now, uh, doing some uh, teaching with you at Berkeley and also some research and writing. But why don't we take a moment here at the beginning and give you uh, a chance to introduce yourself more fully to our listeners. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks for inviting me to uh, participate in the podcast. So I'm a professor at Berkeley. I've been a professor at Berkeley for a long time. And I'm an economist by trade. Uh, and so I work in the economics of healthcare. That includes health insurance and healthcare delivery. But over the past decade or so, I've really focused on what I call the product side of healthcare, which is drugs, medical devices, and the other stuff uh, that goes through FDA. And it's also that's the stuff which is where the innovation dynamic is most intense. And so um, uh, if we think about uh, the healthcare services, it's really about pricing for an efficient delivery of care. Um, and for drugs, it's that plus helping finance the development of new drugs in the future. Yeah, great. Well, why don't we why don't we start there? We ha- you know we have this um, in some respects um, funny system where you know uh, drug companies are granted patents by the government for a period of time, and uh, they're able to you know charge the the prices they want on the market uh, place during that time, and then. And then you eventually you have genericization and a whole bunch of competition, and the prices come way down generally, you know, quite rapidly. Um, it, it seems like a convoluted way to do it. So what's what's behind that, Jamie? Can you comment on it? Sure. <clears throat> I, I will go back to these the two functions of drug prices. One is to reimburse the manufacturing and distribution of existing drugs. And the other one is to help finance R&D for the next generation of drugs. And in principle, we always have to do the former. Okay, if, if, if the drug companies aren't, aren't compensated for that, they'll just go out of the market. But do we have to do the latter? Do drug prices have to contribute to R&D financing? And the answer is no, not necessarily. A bunch of them don't. Um, it, drugs that are subject to open competition, which don't have patent protection or regulatory protection, are called generics or biosimilars, and competition drives their prices down towards the costs of manufacturing and distribution, and therefore they're cheap, which is good for the patient, good for the payer, um, and 
that's all there is to it. The problem is that those drugs don't contribute. There's no, there's no profit that they can use to invest in R&D, and they don't. Uh, generic, uh, generic drugs and the generic drug companies don't do R&D as a general rule. So we could live with that if the, let somebody else, let's say the government or the philanthropic foundations, funded um, drug development. Now, they obviously fund a lot of research, scientific research and clinical research. And in some cases, they funded some drug development. But as a general rule, government grants or grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are not that good at um, incentivizing the creation of actual saleable, usable products, and they're better at the science of the whole thing. And so what we have developed over time by trial and error is a world where uh, drug R&D is financed, let's just say in round numbers, approximately half by the government through many National Institutes of Health and other funds, and about half through industry. And what industry does, where industry gets its money, is by charging high prices. And so as a matter of public policy, in other words, by intent, we create patent policy and we create FDA regulatory exclusivity, which allows, which prevents competition or limits competition and allows companies to set high prices. So we fret about, oh, drug prices are too high, but we, we should say, wait a minute, they're too high by design, by intent. And the, because the, the point of them is to generate profits, frankly, monopoly pricing, monopoly profits, and then the companies are supposed to hopefully invest um, some of that in R&D and pharma invests about 20% of revenues in R&D, which is either a high number or a low number, depending on how you look at it. It is the highest number of any industry in the economy. It's the most research intensive industry in the economy, even with all that NIH support. So that's where I would start. We, we want low prices in order to enhance access. We want high prices in order to subsidize research and development. How do we balance those? That is the big policy issue with pharmaceutical pricing. Yep, great. Well, um, and then the, the private mar sector has a role in all of this as well. The, the manufacturers, uh, once they... Um, uh, get their label and launch their products and manufacture them, as you said, uh, you know, kind of sell them into a distribution channel and then a, an insurance and PBM reimbursement channel as well. How do all those things impact uh, the, the net price, as, as Mark described it earlier? Okay. Well, first of all, they just, people don't follow this stuff. America, you know, about half of Americans get their health insurance through a public program like Medicare and Medicaid, and about half of it get their through um, uh, commercial insurance through their employer or through a health insurance exchange. Now, the same insurance companies will tend to work on both sides of that fence, but anyway, that's the basic split. Then, uh, going back to the nomenclature thing, actually the key distinction is between list price and net price. And list price is the, the price that the manufacturer uh, sets. It's often a global single net list price. And uh, you see that as the manufacturer's pr suggested price for an automobile, the one that's right on the dashboard. Uh, but then the payers go and uh, negotiate discounts or rebates. Uh, and the post rebate price we call the net price. And that's the one that uh, drug companies really care about because that's what they put in their pocket. Um, the list price has certain roles, it's, it's certain functions out there, um, and we can get into that. It gets pretty wonky pretty fast. Uh, the, the essence of understanding drug pricing is not to try to understand it too closely because it is just a quagmire. And as part of my general view of the U.S. healthcare system, what is the biggest single problem of the U.S. healthcare system? It's too complicated. It's too complicated. Even experts, like people listening to this podcast, probably have big gaps in their knowledge. I have big gaps in my knowledge. So um, that's just the way it is. If I could, it is complicated. And I think um, uh, we're going to have some, I want to talk a little bit through a few more examples in just a minute. But we hear about in other nations, it's other nations have lower drug prices. And so can you help us understand why? This country is so difficult, and we have such high prices, and where, uh, how that compares to other nations? 
Okay. Um, well, uh, first of all, there's, let's just say there's rich countries, middle-income countries, and poor countries out there. And pharma generally, I think, they sort of accept the idea that the prices should be higher and high, high and high price countries, medium and then low. Okay. Um, so, but then, so when we talk about high drug prices in America, we really mean within the world of rich countries, America's prices are, are much higher than France, Canada, Japan, that sort of thing. So uh, the question is, why? And I think that there is, um, a direct answer and then sort of an indirect answer. The direct answer is, is that the payers in the United States haven't had the capacity or frankly the incentive to bring those prices down. And I'm talking about Medicare, private payers, and we could get into why that's the case. But we have a tax subsidized healthcare system where everybody's subsidized for what they do. And so that the, the just isn't, has not been that incentive to get really kind of, you know, tough on this. The way, you know, there's a variety of ways to get tough on pricing. Um, and uh, we can talk about those. But they use those in other countries. They use those in some parts of the United States, such as the, Ve the Veterans Administration or Kaiser Permanente Health Plan. They get much lower prices than the others because they're tougher. They're smarter and they're tougher. Um, so that's the direct answer. Uh, and I think that what the U.S. drug purchasing world is getting tougher. And that's one, one of the themes of your podcast. The payers are getting tougher. Uh, and we see that both on the public side with the, the legislation that passed in last year, the Inflation Reduction Act. And we see it on the private side with the more uh, militant PBM and insurer methods, which you all have talked about. And to some extent, this whole podcast is about that. And so they're getting tougher. Uh, and it's possible that the gap between U.S. and, let's say, France and Canada in drug pricing, it will narrow over time. Not go away, but narrow. So that's the first answer direct answer. And the second or indirect answer, and you all can opine on this because you know more than I do, but there are those that say that the drug companies are willing to, to accept lower prices, lower net prices in other wealthy countries because they've been able to count on high prices in America. Uh, and that if, and I'm channeling my inner Donald Trump here, okay, if it were the case that um, America really drove its really said oh, we're not going to pay more than France pays. Then the drug companies would have to get tougher with France. They just would, uh, and they would also probably they would earn less money in America, and um, it would cause all kinds of ramifications. We can talk about that. That'd be another great topic. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's so it's partly it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, and, and obviously not unique to medicines. Healthcare is full of you know cross subsidization. Even within a country, we in the U.S. the hospitals, you know, collect a lot less money from Medicaid and Medicare for similar services from than you know do the cost shifting to the private insurers as well. And you know, it, so I guess the question is, could the you know could the hospitals figure out a way to you know charge more to Medicare and Medicaid? and uh, not have to do as much cost shifting would be the corollary for them. Um, but it's an interesting, you know, it's like a, it's a sort of a trade, you know, an international trade question in that regard. Um, how about the role of generics, Jamie? We, you know, we've, there's been a long history of uh, innovation coming to market, having the premium price for a period of time, then some competition um, with some rebates, as you described, uh, but then followed by genericization and, and pretty broad uh, access then at pretty low prices. And how has that, in, you know, factored into pricing trends over time? And, and then what's the outlook now uh, with all the biologics on the market? What's your sense of the outlook for biosimilars in the U.S.? Well, first of all, uh, starting with generics, um, the, the, the basic uh, public policy to allow companies to have exclusive um, market and therefore charge higher prices um, and, and therefore fund R&D is time limited. So a, a patent lasts for 20 years from the first uh, 
registration, and then there's also a regulatory exclusivity. But at some point, uh, those that time passes. And then the companies, of course, try to extend those patents in all kinds of uh, ways. But, it's, but eventually, they, they, they lose their protection, and then the generics come in and biosimilars. But starting with generics, it's been one of the most incredible successes from a public policy perspective. We have now 92% of prescriptions filled in the United States are filled by generics. That means that they're very cheap. Um, and which is great because they're good. They're the same, you know, they didn't get it worse just because they lost their patent protection. Uh, but it does mean that 92% of the prescriptions are not contributing to financing R&D. So from the industry perspective, they're left with the remaining 8%. And even with those 8%, they're not allowed to charge whatever they want because a certain fraction of those, let's just say, I don't know, six of the eight, I'm just arbitrary now. Six of the eight are for specialty drugs in, in therapeutic classes where everything's still patent protected, but, the, but there's multiple therapeutically similar products. Rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, uh, psoriasis, whatever, those kinds of things. And there, the payers are able to say, listen, you know what, there's actually five drugs that are similar, and we're going to go with three of the five. We're going to go to the ones that give us the biggest rebate. And so what's your rebate? And that means that the price, the net price to pharma really comes down. So that leaves them with that 2% where the markets are like orphan drugs, gene therapies, where there isn't this kind of competition. And there, they, they do have you know, really strong pricing power. Not infinite, because at some point the countries say, I just cannot pay that, and I won't. And this, I'm sorry, baby's going to die, that kind of stuff. But still, and so now what we have is the, 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 global, the global pharmaceutical industry R&D enterprise is like a pyramid upside down. It is 92% at the top, fund nothing, that's all generics. Then come, the special, then come the specialty drugs in the U.S. market. And the U.S. market accounts for about 75% of global profits. So you can, at that point, you can kind of forget France. So you're down to that 8%. And within that 8%, 6 of the 8, the PBMs are getting these 40 to 50% rebates. And then at the very bottom, you have the uh, gene and cell therapies and some orphans, and they're priced very high. And the companies are making a nice profit off of those. But still, the number of patients is in the thousands, not in the millions. And so I consider it to be a very unstable uh, uh, enterprise, even aside from Inflation Reduction Act, even aside from... Uh, Anything that's going on, it's just that we, we the, the, the part that's financed by the industry, it's really not sustainable as it is. And so uh, this is a broader topic that we can get to at some other time yeah. if we want. What's the alternative model for funding R&D? Well, related to that, Jamie, it, it, you know, we've talked sometimes about um, one of the worries I have related to that is in therapeutic areas, disease states that have lots of generics available, which is a great thing for um, patients, as you point out. Um, there's still a lot of unmet, you know, residual medical need. Um, not, uh, heart disease is a great example. We have lots of medicines on the market for heart disease, but it's still our nation's number one killer. But for a, a, an innovative um, manufacturer, it's very hard actually to come out with a new medicine in cardiovascular disease that is going to get generate enough use at a price that's high enough um, to make it attractive. This is kind of what happened to antibiotics, you know, some years ago, but it seems to be happening in other areas. Um, what, what's your outlook for that? Do you, or, and what would you recommend about, you know, somebody that wanted to try to uh, address that? Well, from the social policy perspective of, let's say, treating <clears throat> heart disease, uh, high cholesterol, um, you know, the first thing is we need better adherence got a lot of people who they could be taking the cheap statin and they're not okay well getting them to take it is a whole complex thing but it's really not about drug innovation it's about behavioral issues and there's some cost sharing dimensions to that and uh, apparently uh, only 50 percent of the drugs prescribed 50 percent of prescriptions are actually filled by patients and so that's step number one 
then, as you point out, even for, I mean, a patient that is eligible for a statin and won't take it shouldn't, from a social policy perspective, then be administered a $10,000. You can't go from $5 to $10,000 just because the patient can't be bothered to put this thing in their mouth. It just it, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. But as you point out, there are patients where even if they're taking their statins, uh, they still have very high cholesterol for either genetic reasons or some other reason. And they should uh, be have access to the new generation of uh, specialty drugs, which are like other, therefore, specialty drugs, therefore, narrow niche of patients, even though lots of people have heart disease. Most of those people who have heart disease don't have statin-resistant heart disease. Right. The, the problem is, how do you identify these patients? Because then, the, then the, the payers are going to say, okay, we're going to put on all kinds of prior auth and step therapy and... Uh, and that's what they did with the PCSK9s and whatever. And the problem is that that stuff's so blunt that, you know, and as you pointed out, because often we're talking patients are elderly, they're already taking six meds, trying to convince them to take a seventh, especially if it's an injection. It's hard enough as it is. Doctors are stressed. They don't have much time with the patients. It's just, they just kind of just don't do it. They don't prescribe. So, um, there's definitely work needs to be done there for, for appropriate targeting of patients. And then a powering down, frankly, of the, you know, as you pointed out in many cases, some sort of a powering down in these specialty areas if the, 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 the drug company accepts a more moderate price, the, the, the payer should accept a, a easier access, low, you know, weaker, no prior authorization and cost sharing burdens. And so it's a trade-off. Um, we have more people taking the drug, but each person or, and their payer is paying less per. You know, and we, we figured that out. There's got to be a way, but it's got to be a targeted thing because we can't we can't put 50% of the people in America that have heart disease on a, a $10,000 drug. Right. Well, Jamie, if I could, you know, you mentioned earlier about the sort of the 6%. You know, the the specialty drugs that have. Uh, um, our funding that have rebates that have other therapies on there. Uh, obviously, recently this year, uh, Humira uh, has a biosimilar on the market. Um, and um, but in your book, and the book is called uh, Purchasing Medical Innovation, uh, you state that consumers should not face cost sharing for medical technologies that lack effective alternatives. Um, and you mentioned that the benefit designs are just the opposite. You know uh, that they're imposing high cost sharing on breakthrough technologies that are expensive and yet have no alternatives. In the case of Amgen's decision to price their biosimilar with two list prices, you know, um, it, it appears to be a conflict, right? To, to this sort of this whole premise of, of, uh, of what the des benefit design is supposed to be doing and helping to lower prices with generics. Um, so how can the biosimilar markets do something besides uh, two-tier pricing to try to have the same sort of effect uh, as generics are having on the on the on the uh, chemical side of the business. Well, I think that there's two issues going on in that that question. One is the uh, this, this the strange thing about these two different prices for the same drug. That is really a um, epiphenomenon of the whole uh, PBM rebate structure. Uh, and which is very pathological and but, but very important and we can talk about that the other aspect is uh, what do we think about biosimilars and will biosimilars um, uh, repeat the experience of, uh, of uh, generics for the large molecule drugs and b b by which I mean lots of competitors coming in um, driving the price down, lots of competition, driving the price down um, and, and allowing um, utilization to go up. Um, and I'll talk about either one of those you wish, either one you wish. I, I could start, I, mean, I, I think I'd more rather talk about biosimilars than about the pathology of the PBMs. But the PBMs world is very pathological. I guess I would say this about the, but so is the whole system. I'll, whatever you want to talk about. Well, let's go with the let's go with the biosimilars. How do you feel that they could um, uh, 
carve out a, an effective place in the uh, in the uh, medical payment and drug drug processing world. Okay, so biosimilars differ from generics in that usually, although it's not always the case, but usually. Uh, in order to have a patient switch from the, the biologic to the biosimilar, the doctor, prescribing doctor, needs to change the prescription. It's not like with a generic where the doctor writes the thing for the, for the branded drug and at the pharmacy, the pharmacist switches. Okay? Patient doesn't know the difference. Nobody cares because they're identical the molecules. They're the same thing. Biologics, biosimilars are not identical. They're similar but they're not identical and so although there's certain interchangeable ones, generally it's the doctor has to get involved. And so that's one, one feature. Um, and then the, the, the biologics are often used in narrower therapeutic classes. So there's fewer patients. You put those two together and you kind of go, whoa, wait a minute, how much competition is there really going to be here? How much patients are going to switch back and forth? Now, in Europe, the biosimilars have been a, a, a major success. They've, they've got a lot of entry of new biosimilars in for each of these therapeutic classes, and they've used purchasing techniques, tendering and other things, to really drive competition. There's been major savings, including for Humira and its biosimilars. Prices have really come down, like I think in the 90% range. Even wow. though it's, it's a very big drug, therefore there's a lot, I think there's like six or eight biosimilars for Humira. But this is a big, it's a big class. So, uh, whereas we in the United States have lagged and there's uh, sort of Humira-specific reasons. Uh, Humira is a self-injected drug that it goes through the retail channel and through the Part D channel for Medicare. That's, and, and for those of you that are wonks, that's part of the reason why it's so screwed up. Most of the other biosimilars and biologics are infused drugs, physician-infused drugs. They go through the hospital or provider channel, so-called buy and bill, specialty channel, and Part B in Medicare. And after all these delays, now suddenly, no, recently, uh, biosimilar market share is really surging. It is a now a major deal, particularly in the cancer uh, domain, particularly uh, facing these uh, Genentech drugs, these great drugs, Avastin, Herceptin, Rituxin. They, uh, the latest reports, I believe, is that the biosimilars have more than 50% market share for those now. And they're coming on, they're coming on strong. And uh, so there the issue is, what are the incentives for the doctor to switch? And what about the patient? And that, so it's really about doctor, doc, when I say doctor, I mean provider, you know, hospitals. Uh, how they get paid, and then for the consumer, what is their cost sharing? And how does that, how does that vary between the biosimilar and the biologic? And um, we, can, we can talk about how uh, there's a pathology there uh, in the system. Of course, that's where you get to this Humira nonsense. Um, but it's been working, so to speak, from a purchase perspective, on the cancer side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, Jamie, I'd be interested in your health economist views about the rebate system um, and what it does well, and you know some some of the things that not so well. Well, um, the origin of the system is that the essence of the system is that the drug companies want to and need to. And so the payers agree with this, sell the same drug at different prices to different buyers. That's the essence of it. Um, and so how do you do that? Um, and so the way they do it is they say there's a single price for this drug, and then I'm going to negotiate confidential discounts, or call them rebates, uh, for, with different payers at different levels. And that's going to allow me to do this, what we economists call price discrimination, but price discrimination is not a bad thing. It can be a good thing. For example, most obviously, we'll sell the same drug cheaper in poor countries than in rich countries. That's the very first thing. And then, in, as you pointed out earlier, in the U.S., they, they often get less money from uh, public payers than they get from private payers. Now, it's a good thing, bad thing, depending on your perspective. Um, and so that's that is the issue, and so the question is, well, why do we have these 
Why don't they just negotiate a discount rather than these strange rebates? And what a rebate is, a discount is like, say something like, okay, this drug costs 100 bucks. I'm going to negotiate now. I'm actually um, only going to pay you 80 bucks. And so for every dose that, 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 that one of my people uses, you get 80 bucks. End of discussion. Uh, rebate's different. It says, okay, the price is 100 bucks. And we'll pay you 100 bucks per dose. And then, though, we're going to keep track of how many doses were used over the whole course of the year. And in fact, we're going to keep track of how many doses of all of our drugs, if I'm a drug company, all of my drugs being, being uh, can purchased by one payer over the course of the year. And how much money did I, you know, did I give, send to you? And the more that number, and then I'm going to, we're going to negotiate and you're going to give me a rebate. You're going to give me a fraction of that back. And why you would do that is another complication has to do with you know, my bargaining power. And so that means we're leaving in place these list prices, and then we have the net price, which comes back, which is what the, which is what the pharma company actually collects. And in between, there's the list to net bubble, it's sometimes referred to. And what happens to that? And that is... Um, that is, there's a role on, on, on well, one of, there's two different ch channels in which drugs go through basically there's the retail channel which where there's the PBMs and then there's the provider channel where there's the hospitals and their group purchasing organizations and each of those intermediaries has figured out that taking a big chunk of the flow of money as it goes by is actually extremely profitable to them. I work in my, my econometric work mostly on the hospital channel and on the Part B drugs and in the, in the commercial sector. And uh, the, the hospitals make more money off of infused drugs than do the manufacturers of those drugs. The, the markups are over 100%. In addition, they get these special discounts in their acquisition, so-called 340B, and that even adds even more. So uh, hospitals are making, making big bucks off of pharma, and they, they like the money. They need the money. They think they're underpaid by Medicare and Medicaid, and there are people in Congress kind of, believe, kind of agree, and so it's very kind of stable. But it's bad for pharma. Because they're like, wow, you know, the payer thinks that they paid 100 bucks. I only got 50. All these other people got the hospitals and the PBMs got the others. Now, and then the problem is that those intermediaries, and this goes actually for the hospitals, but especially for the PBMs, what they want is, is for the patient to use the, the drug that's got the biggest rebate, not the lowest net price, not the not the highest list price, but the one with the biggest gap between the list and the net, because that's what they get. This this chunk in the middle, now they can distribute it between its complex part of, there's a, usually a health insurer involved, there's a PBM involved, there's pharmacy distributors involved. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people feeding at the trough, uh, so to speak, but it is very perverse because uh, it lends itself to uh, resistance to price cuts. And this is back to your thing about the Humira example. The reason why Humira, the company AbbVie, uh, has two prices, one of which is going to be a high price with a high rebate, so the, 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 the PBMs will go for that one. And the other one is a, a lower price with a lower rebate. And that's for some sort of residual, some, some I don't even know, whatever doesn't go through the PBMs or something else uh, out there. Um, and it is... Um, it is one of the top 2,000 perversities of the American system. Yeah. Well, that, that takes us to uh, another thing that, was, that I pulled from your book was that you had referenced uh, Michael Chernew's uh, 2007 health affairs article that was entitled Value-Based Insurance Design. Um, you know, and in that, you, you sort of talk about how right now, the, it's all we, we, we have these... Uh, you know, coverage should should not be generous for costly services and skimpy for cheap alternatives, but instead generous for effective services and skimpy for ineffective al um, alternatives. 
are there examples of uh, of value-based insurance design, and is that a potential idea or new model for for us to think about uh, benefit design going forward? I think the idea that of uh, aligning the patient's cost sharing with the clinical effectiveness of a drug it's a nice idea. The problem is, in reality, it's the the clinical effectiveness of the drug is hard to measure. It varies from patient to patient. It's hard to gather data on it. It's it's very complex. It's like it's like trying to align drug prices with clinical effectiveness, so-called outcomes-based pricing. Once again, great idea, implementation challenges, and what. VBID, value-based insurance design, made a big splash a decade or more ago. It's a great idea. Uh, but when you actually want to look, what, what does it really boil down to in practice? It means that they're saying, well, um, patients should have a zero copay on uh, generic drugs for diabetes. Okay? Which is, fun, you know, that's cool. But that's not like, eh, you know what I mean? That's not where the money's flowing. Uh, whether they pay a $10 copay or a zero copay isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to transform anything. So I've really rotated to a different perspective. I think that cost sharing um, has uh, pernicious and, advantage, and, and, and one pernicious and one advantageous function in society. The pernicious effect is that a patient who has been prescribed a drug which is in the opinion of the doctor uh, and it's gone through the FDA and everything is the right drug for that patient given their condition, why should they have cost sharing? I mean, any cost sharing. Right. You know, this whole notion that you're, you're supposed to have skin in the game, what does that mean? for a patient that's, you know, got psoriasis and they've got some drug that works on them and, and why should they, because then it just cost sharing is just punitive for the sick. It means you've got psoriasis, therefore we're gonna, we're gonna raid your bank account. That's basically what it is. So I think that's unethical and I think that uh, it just leads to all kinds of bad, bad outcomes. So I'm opposed to that person. There is a good, there, so that's the bad. What's the good function? The good function of cost sharing is in those situations where there are therapeutically equivalent drugs and they have different prices. So this could be the generic versus the brand, or it could be within the brands. It could be biosimilar versus biologic. And there, you know, once again, assuming that they are equivalent, all right, that's an assumption. Uh, then my view is that the best model cost sharing is what they use, what they call therapeutic reference pricing, which is which, uh, that the patient pays nothing if they use the cheaper one, and then they pay the difference if they use the more expensive one. Now they don't pay the whole difference; they just, I mean, the whole thing of the expensive one. They just pay the difference. So in, in this our case, let's say the biosimilar costs fifty bucks and the biologic costs a hundred bucks. You could, I would support generally a benefit design which says zero copay on the biosimilar, fifty dollar copay on the biologic. Okay. Now, if the patient has a special need for the biologic, and that can be it's an exception to the rule, that's fine. Let's let's give them. The, but but in any case, no copay for the for the for the bio, biosimilar. Why would you do that? By you know, there's no justification for that, because by definition. This drug was prescribed by a doctor, patients got the disease, you know, et cetera. Now, if, it's the, if you don't believe that, if you believe that the doctor is not prescribing appropriately or whatever, then, you got, then there's a different issue. But then, you know, cost sharing is not, you know, I mean, if doctors are over prescribing, let's say, because they get kickbacks from the drug companies or they're getting, you know, they're wined and dined by the drug companies, which happens. Well, how are we going to deal with that? Well, consumer cost sharing is just not the right tool for the job. Right. I mean, let's go at the doctor. Right? Yeah. How about uh, commenting a bit on your view of uh, the role of government and uh, how we're doing, you know, with uh, government um, steps to, you know, try to help strike a better balance, I'll say, between all of these competing objectives? 
But may, maybe specifically something on the IRA as well, Jamie. How do you see that affecting things? Um, let's see. Well, the the government, uh, you know, who's the government? But whatever. There's a lot of thoughtful people there. They understand that we're trying to make drugs both accessible and affordable and support innovation. They get it. They understand. It. Um, they're under various pressures. There is a lot of strong, immediate, short-term pressure to hold down drug prices uh, and all this perversity stuff, but it's, it's out there. And um, a lot of senior citizens, these people vote. Um, and then when we have these, all these reports about how America's paying twice as much as Canadians are paying, there's just this, you know, it's like the Donald Trump effect. You know, they're getting away with murder. Farmers getting away with murder. How else is possible? Slam them. Let's get them. And there's a lot of that kind of energy out there. Uh, and so that's one thing. Then there's an even more, sort of more narrower version is, uh, we've got a, a, a problem with Medicare spending is, is higher than, I mean, Medicare is funded by taxes. Politicians don't like raising taxes. And so they want to find a way to subsidize Medicare, basically, without raising taxes. And so one way of doing that is to reduce what Medicare pays out. That's for drugs. But of course, it's also for physician services, for hospital services, et cetera. And what they figured out is if they can reduce what they pay, the providers and the drug companies will increase what they charge to the to the other payers, to the private payers. And so it's a way for private payers to subsidize the public payers. And it's very deeply entrenched. It's, uh, you know, perversity number 672B in <laughs> our health care system. The list is growing. Isn't oh, you know, it? it's, it's a long, long list. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that the IRA... Uh, Uh, it was a long time coming, you know, I mean, it, it, pharma has been uh, squeezing this, you know, milk and the goat or whatever you want to call it, the American the, the payer for a long time. And this thing about paying twice as much as Canada just wasn't sustainable. This whole upside down pyramid with 92 percent generics I and mean, the whole thing is crazy. I don't think that the IRA by itself changes it that much. I mean, I think that this limit on, on post-launch price increases is real. But frankly, they're targeting things like Humira and all these people who are just like egregious violators of the, of the contract. There really should be a, there, implicitly there's a social contract between the payer and the provider in the pharma market where the, the payer agrees to, to pay for a, a reasonable amount for effective drugs and the pharma agrees to make sure their drugs are effective and they're only marketed to where the patients that will really benefit and that they will post a price which is kind of sustainable. You know, I spent a fair amount of time in, this is a digression, I spent a fair amount of time in Germany and talking to payers, pharma, government. And what's really interesting is that everybody uses the same term. It's Wirtschaftlichkeit means efficiency. And they all agree that the system has to be efficient. There's, there's a limited amount of money, even in a rich country like Germany. And pharma agrees with that. Payers agree with that. Doctors agree with that. Doctors, yeah, we, do, we, we believe in efficient prescribing. Now, of course, they can interpret that how they want. But still, there's this concept that there's a social contract that we don't have infinite amount of money. It's not a matter of your rights versus my rights. It's that we collectively have to make this thing work out. And I think it's beneficial. I think it partly explains why Germany's healthcare system works reasonably well, uh, financially as well as innovation. Um, but anyway, back to um, back to your point. I think, and this is a little bit about not what you asked, but I think, and I and partly I've gotten this from you over the years that the current model of pricing is not sustainable and, and shall not be sustained. And uh, that people who think that the pharma industry is making excess profits and blah, 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 are just really not paying attention to the trend. 
and that this is going to adversely affect how much money pharma has to invest in R&D, particularly outside of those niche genes and cell therapies. And so if we want to uh, have continued investment in antibiotics and, and heart disease and diabetes and you know, blah, blah, we need an additional source of, of revenue. And uh, it will be interesting to see whether this current talk about industrial policy and uh, with the COVID experience, whether we lead to more uh, government investment of public funds into product development, you know, you know channeled through the venture capitalists so they can manage the whole thing, but ultimately, tech, just like with COVID, it was actually taxpayer dollars, uh, but then it ended up in the pockets of pharma, and they, right? Um, and through ARPA-H's would be the channel. That's what they're doing in Europe now. All the companies, they want to have a French pharma industry. They want to sustain it in France. They want to sustain it in Germany. And so they, historically, they just want to pay less. The only thing that they cared about was paying less. Now they want to pay less, but they also want industry to invest mm-hmm. locally. And so now suddenly, whoa, slow down. France just announced that they were raising prices on generic drugs. With that raising for that reason. Wow. Well, this is a lot there. So um, we wrap up every episode, Jamie, with uh, the question uh, of what is your prescription for better access? <coughs> well, I, and I know you've I know you've given us a lot. So yeah. uh, well, what is your I, prescription for better access? Well, I like uh, what, uh, what you and Scott are all about, which is that uh, we need to have a social contract of fair pricing and fair access. It's got to be a trade-off, and we can quibble around the details, but we've got to agree on that basic principle. And um, and everybody's got to be in. This includes the government as a payer, by the way. It includes private payers. It includes the PBMs and all those people. And it's tough because all these people have their own uh, uh, their own goals and their own interpretations. But this basic idea of a social contract a fair price and fair access, and actually, part of that also, fair investment in innovation. You know, uh, that that's really part of it, and we have to figure that out too. Uh, but it's so I, I, that's what I would say. And this is, of course, only a tenured professor could talk like this. The solution is a social contract. Now you guys go out and negotiate that, make it happen. I just <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> Well, speaking of that, Professor, um, we uh, you get to you get to do a little grading of uh, your two students here. Uh, we uh, we wrap up every episode with uh, some key takeaways, and since I uh, am hogging the microphone right now, I'm going to let my uh, my wonderful co-host uh, start with the takeaways. Okay. Well, thanks, Mark. Well, I, I obviously I've um, always enjoy working and, and listening to Jamie uh, talk about these things. I think he's got. Uh, one of the things I admire so much about him is that uh, he's, he's got all the academic framework and, and uh, you know, the theory and uh, the data and evidence and all that sort of thing. But uh, he cares about, you know, application in the real world and, and do, applying it in a way that will actually make a difference in, in, uh, f- you know, for real people. And I think that came through, you know, loud and clear here. I think, you know, every episode we do mark the, the complexity, the incredible complexity of uh, the system that we've got here in the U.S. comes through. And, uh, and, and frankly, the, the imbalance, Jamie spoke about the imbalances in a variety of ways, the 92% versus the 6% versus the 2, uh, cost shifting from, you know, government um, payers to private payers and on and on and on. And um, and just how all that mix is just making it increasingly um, unsustainable, and uh, you know, and now we've heard it from the you know kind of the academic health economist perspective as well. So uh, it seems to me like we've got some work to do, and you know, we got to got to get some real answers for the prescription for better access. How about you, Mark? Well, no, I agree with you. All great points. Um, uh, just a couple that I would add is um, is is sort of like the the, the first starting point is is what do we want as a society and he brought that out uh very well that um uh, we don't have to have a society of innovation you know there's uh countries out there uh that are very strong in the generic manufacturing world uh where they don't really have an innovative you know side of that business um 
And so, you know, in this country, we do. And in the wealthy countries, we do have that, uh, that, that those, those companies that do invest. And so um, if we want to be able to achieve, and people, again, you, you mentioned COVID, Jamie had mentioned COVID, um, where to think about the speed in which we were able to have a vaccine without realizing, people realizing that that was 10 years of research by these manufacturers on this technology to get us to that starting point of which everybody now is aware of what, what was been able to be achieved. So I think it is critical for us as a society to continue to say yes, um, because, you know, again, we still have too many patients, too many diseases that are untreated. And uh, as uh, President Biden has recently said with his cancer moonshot, we have to do more to try to cure all cancers. And, and of course, cancer is just one of the many uh, challenging, including all the rare diseases that continue to be out there. So for me, that was a that was a critical point. Um, and then, you know, I guess the other thing is, is, is I'm going to steal a quote from his book and uh, Jamie, bear with me. Uh, but he does call it sort of senseless when it comes to the patients. Um, it's senseless for us to invest in research. And I'm paraphrasing, Jamie, so just bear with me. But to invest in research, to protect the IP, to evaluate safety, safety and effectiveness, to compare clinical and cost effectiveness, ensure efficient delivery, do all of that, and then create financial barriers for the patient to access this drug. It's just senseless, you know. Um, these patients, uh, in many cases, don't have an option. There are not, not alternative drugs out there. I do agree that where there is alternative drugs, cost sharing, that's the whole point of cost sharing and what was intended to do. But it's been perverted by the, by the, by the crazy complex system that we are trying to solve here. So I think those are sort of two big things that I, 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 I took away from today. Yep, great. And so, Jamie, thank you so much. Or Professor Robinson, how did your students do here? Excellent. Now uh, we'll see how they do when they, you know, we email out the test. Uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, uh, my thing, my whole world is all about how do we do academia in the world of chat GPT? Yeah, good luck yeah. figuring that one out, too. Well, we are we are not able to solve that today, but we'll uh, we'll happy, happily do an episode in the future for you. Uh, but uh, so let me wrap up. Scott, any final comments before I wrap up? No, it was just a, a, a real pleasure to have Jamie with us today, Mark. And I'd just like to add my thanks as well. Thank you, Jamie. Great. Well, thank you, Jamie. I uh, want to also, of course, thank my co-host, uh, Dr. Scott Howe. Uh, you know, this is now our fourth episode in, in, the, uh, in the can, so we're excited about that. Uh, also, we are going to have show notes uh, attached to this episode, so if you uh, want to learn more, uh, about uh, about Jamie and uh, maybe even his book, buy his book, um, and uh, we'll have show notes. And finally, uh, my children have started listening to the podcast. They've told me I need to ask everybody for five stars. So apparently in the podcast world, uh, getting five stars makes a difference. So uh, we are going to continue to be available wherever you're listening to podcasts, but we appreciate your support uh, and uh, look forward to uh, to the next time. So with that, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Scott. 